Re- reflecting on time, the, the present, the here and now, the pachubana. There's a that's all there ever really is in terms of experience. Uh, you can say experience is now. And you keep kind of contemplating this, how this is, the, this is all we have is the present moment. And future is the unknown, the past is a memory. Because right now somehow maybe your future plans are more important than this moment. Now we, the worldly conditioning is, is always uh, this kind of urgency. Uh, you've got to do something. Uh, there's something impending thing in the future. Uh, something you have to do. Something you haven't done yet. You have to get something you don't have. Or this feeling that you've got to get rid of the things you have. Or you've got to change yourself. These are this kind of compulsive feeling, this ob- these obsessions of the mind based on uh, identification with the five khandhas. And this reflection this morning, we, they, we're using the word identification, uh, upadana, uh, panchupadana khanda, identification with the five groups, or clinging, in upadana translates as clinging, attachment, identity, identification with them is is like, I am, these are my, I am this way, I'm this body, I am my feelings, my perceptions, my emotions, my consciousness. And even though we don't, we don't usually think this in such a deliberate way, we assume this all the time, the ignorant mind makes this assumption, always coming from I am, this personality, my emotions, my body, my life, my opinion. So that identification is, I am these, these conditions, is, is never challenged by most people, and that this is how we tend to live our lives, operating with these assumptions, never challenged, never really looking at the way it actually is in the present moment. We just assume that right now I am the five khandhas, no question about it. So, so the Buddha challenged this assumption, you know, the wake up and look at the way it is. So this sense of waking up, the Buddha is, Buddha is the awakened, the awakened mind. I was in Cambodia in 97, I was invited there for a month and people were asking, we gave a talk at the university in Phnom Penh and they the students were saying, well, the communists told us that Buddhism was one of the main reasons for all the problems of Cambodia because it was such a backward religion, it kept everybody stupid. (laughs) Of course, that's what the communists say about every religion. They say, I said, you know, well, it's, Buddhism, Buddhist teaching is, is not a religion, is not, he's not teaching us to be stupid, he's, it's a religion of awakening. Buddha is saying, wake up, he's not saying, um, become stupid. <laughs> In fact, the communists were the stupid ones. <laughs> And then I said, you know, if, if the Cambodians had really practiced Buddhism, probably all that wouldn't have happened. Uh, you know, Pol Pot was a, was a temple boy, you know, brought up in a Buddhist culture. And Cambodia was a, used to be a lovely country, kind of a very elegant kind of culture and, and uh, 
you know, had had I mean, not to say it was perfect, but it certainly had uh, a lovely cultural feeling in the Buddhist and the, the and a lot of the the beauty that come from Buddhist uh, culture and Buddhist civilization were were very much a part of the old Cambodia. So this was, but then any can any religion as it becomes a status quo oftentimes loses the the the, the you know the the real purpose of it. Uh, teaching, or it's overlooked, like with Christianity, uh, the actual profound message of Jesus Christ is generally ignored by most Christians. Mm. So they say that this this is teaching of awakening. Wake up. Pay attention. It's not a religion that puts you to sleep, makes you, puts you in a dozy state under a tree, and you just say, "I don't want to know anything," like the uh, ostrich sticking his head into the sand, or just closing your eyes and say, "I don't want to, I don't want to see or hear anything, hear no evil, speak no evil." It's not a religion of the three monkeys. <laughs> so awakened mind knows evil, isn't it? It's not the Buddha knows the evil one. Buddha knows Mara. It's not refusing to look or admit there's anything wrong. <coughs> but it's always in this present moment that there's enlightenment. Enlightenment is now. Liberation is now. The deathless reality is now. Non-suffering uh, is now. Uh, so this, this is not to be believed, but to be investigated. Now, very, just to review it, like the past right now, what is the past? And there's a reflection on the way it is and what we're doing. At this moment, we're sitting here, and so what is the past right now? There's a way of contemplating, is getting perspective. What is yesterday right now? Perception, isn't it? We have a perception of yesterday and we have memories. Remember certain things that happened. So you're, you're contemplating, this is reflecting on the way it is. So the past, now, at this moment, Pachubana Dhamma is, let's say, a memory. Sanya. the sanya kanda. Uh, I cling to the sanya kanda, I think, yesterday I did this, I 
went here, I met these people, ate this food, and on and on like that. So that's like I, I'm identifying with the memories. I'm attaching to those memories. I'm not questioning. I'm not reflecting on the way it is. I'm merely operating on with the habits of uh, I am my past, my past, my memories, what I've done in the past, the things that have happened to me in the past. And these are, I believe in this completely. And so my past is very real. So I can bring up things of the past and I can still feel resentful about something that happened 40 years ago. I noticed this like where, when I was in the Navy in the mid-50s, I had a bad experience in the military where I was accused of something I didn't do. I felt so angry and indignant and so resentful and and over the years, you know, I could intellectually say, uh, you know, I can forgive. But actually, emotionally, I was, I could, 20 years later, I, start, if I remember this incident, I still feel angry. And if I developed that anger, I'd even want to, still want to seek revenge. <clears throat> even though I don't like to be revengeful, I'm not, I don't, I really, I'm not a the type of person that uh, that acts on revengeful feelings, but I certainly can feel them. So, I noticed even up to twenty years, just remembering this incident, I'd still feel the same anger and desire to get even, or you know, to try to. Yeah, get even with that person. And then 30 years later, same thing. <laughs> or just a memory in the present, you know, that ha over something that happened so long ago. So the power of memory is like that, isn't it? You remember something and you can just wind yourself up into a state of, of outrage over something that happened 40 years ago. And so this is, this is the power of memory, how you can stir people up, like getting the, the, the Protestants in, in Northern Ireland uh, to stir them up against the Catholics, or stir up the Irish against the English, uh, about what the English did 100 years ago to Ireland, or what the Tutsis and have done to the Hutus and what the Serbs uh, uh, and the Albanians and Kosovo is being is who who really has a right to Kosovo? Well, back in 1349, uh, the big battle when the Serbs were and there's a Kosovo belongs to Serbia, even though there's no hardly any Serbians living there. What about this place, California? Belongs to the Indians, Native Americans. <laughs> we can make a case for this. We can really wind ourselves up about, you know, how the white man just came over and just took over this whole continent, has swept over it and broke every promise and, and, dis and kind of totally disempowered the Native people. And we can really get indignant about that, even though my ancestors were involved in this process of ripping off the natives, I could still feel indignant about it. Because that's the power of, of perception, isn't it? You can, a demagogue or, uh, you know, any kind of troublemaker is very good at winding masses of people up to get them to do, to start to uh, go to war, to persecute another group. So this is the power of identification with sanya and sanya sankara, vedana sanya sankara. 
And we're reflecting on that. Right now then, the memory of my uh, unpleasant experience in the military 40 years ago, now I don't feel anything because I've resolved that through this awareness. In fact, I even feel a kind of gratitude because I realize that at that time where I was where I was blamed for something I didn't do and I felt so angry and so resentful that something in me kind of grew up a bit more to deal with it. Where before that I was really, you know, trying to fit in and be, you know, one of the boys and 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 just, you know, <clears throat> feeling intimidated by military life and and hadn't really, you know, just hadn't really looked at myself very much, just going along with things. And and when this happened, suddenly I started questioning. I think, what's this about? And is this, is this the kind of people I want to join? Do I really want to fit into this kind of situation? Do I really... And I started questioning. I began to, through that kind of shock, it was an awakening experience, even though it was suffering. Something in me grew up a little bit more than, it, than, it, than, than there was before that incident. So I, I see now. I can only, I feel gratitude for, a, a, a strangely, a sense of gratitude for that. Where say, twenty years ago, I just felt, you know, just think of it, and I just increase. I just still get angry and indignant, like it was before. Just contemplate this in your own life. Uh, that the past, don't hang on to the past, don't, don't identify, but that doesn't mean to reject or to deny, but to understand what the past really is in terms of the present, because this is all there is. Experience is right now, this moment. Consciousness is now. This is the conscious moment. So, uh, reflection, uh, reflecting on the way it is, not the way we think it is or assume it is. So then, uh, okay, what is the past right now? It's, it's just put it in the term of, it's a memory. Or a perception, isn't it? It's tomorrow, or yesterday is a perception. Even just the word yesterday. In the present. Which doesn't it's not a put down or denial of 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 the past experience, but it's putting it in perspective in terms of the present of the way it is now. And apply that to to tomorrow, the future, next year, Y two K, the next century, next millennium, two thousand. What is what is the future now in terms of experience now? The perception it's perception, isn't it? Again it's sanya, tomorrow, next year is But it, it's about things that haven't happened yet. It's not a memory. The future is not a memory. You can't remember the future. So, so you project possibilities. Uh, so we proliferate. This could happen. That could happen. Hope. I hope that everything will be. I dread everything will go wrong. Speculate. Anticipate. Worry. Dread. Fear all kinds of possibilities about the future. But that's actually taking place in the present. So the future is 
the unknown. And, and it's very important to, to know not knowing as experience. Not knowing is like this. The future, what's going to happen tomorrow? Don't know. Well, we've got a plan for this, uh, this uh, opening ceremony. We've got to make plans, and that's fair enough, make plans. But in terms of direct knowing in the present, right now, tomorrow is the unknown. It hasn't happened yet. We don't remember it. We could, we could, there's possibilities for all kinds of things happening tomorrow. There are certain things that probably will happen. There's probability, more than likely, well, probably we feel very sure that this will happen. And, but, the, but what, but as experience right now is it's the unknown, isn't it? don't know. So, in, in terms of the unawakened mind, we're, we're always holding on to possibilities for the future, isn't it? When I finish this, when I get my degree, when I find the right person, when I have the right job, when I own my own house, when I, uh, you know, this kind of thing. The future, because it is unknown, it's got all kinds of potential for success and failure. So what is it that knows now? You know, what Is it a person? Is it me? What? So there is the knowing, isn't it? Knowing is like this. At this present time, this, we have the ability to know the pace and Quran each other. All conditions are impermanent. This is the experience of consciousness, and like consciousness, is when when you're born, you're kind of you become a separate conscious entity in the universe, and each one of us is a separate conscious entity in the universe. It's the reality of the situation, and so we're. Looking at the, and this consciousness then can be used with ignorance, stupidity, or it can be informed with wisdom. So this is the purpose of the Buddhist teaching, to inform consciousness with wisdom. So on the convention we say, I'm, I'm knowing, but in terms of the, there's the knowing. Knowing is like this, because even the perception of I'm knowing can be seen as an object. And the thought I know is, in a state of pure attention, is a, is a mental object. It comes and goes, the thought. I am the knowing is, is something that arises and ceases. But that attentive awareness stays, isn't it? That's sustainable. That kind of centered, still attentiveness 
listening, this, the mind composed, open, receptive, attentive, listening. That's, that, that embraces all the, the five khandhas. And this, this is what I'm doing is reflecting on the way it is, on time. It's very, I found reflecting on time very helpful because it's so, my habit was so, you know, so insidious to be caught up in the future is reality or the past is reality or personality is reality. I can give, you know, my my memories of somebody thinking that my memory is the actual person. It's so convincing, isn't it? I know, do you know this person? Yes, uh, yeah, I know him. He's like this. <coughs> what is that? In terms of now, they remember somebody. It's a, is that a person or is it a memory? That's a, that's a memory, <laughs> and yet we can we remember. We think we know somebody, but we're actually attaching to a memory of somebody. Mm. So in your practice, it's, it's reflective. And reflection isn't dependent on meditation retreats. So, so because we teach this, maybe you know, on a meditation retreat, the mind oftentimes thinks that this you have to have these kind of idyllic conditions to do this. And then you, you perceive your own, maybe your ordinary life or your home life is... Well, I can't do that at home. I've got so many other things that uh, demand my attention. And you go on like that. Uh, I may be thinking that it's only in special situations, such as something like this, that you can do this. Don't believe that. It's so easy to, to connect insight with with a technique or a place or a particular situation. But even in the crowded marketplace, you get the ability to reflect is still the possible. It's like using things, and because I've done over the past fifteen years, I've done a lot, enormous amount of traveling, and so and then, you know, traveling by air, going through international airports, waiting in uh, queues uh, to board airplanes, uh, going through immigration, through customs, waiting for my bags to appear. And uh, and then waiting for somebody to come and meet me. Start waiting and waiting in lines, going through the procedures of 
of international travel. So at first, when I first started doing this, I felt really kind of, I had aversion to it. I just wanted to get through the line, you know, get out of the immigration, get through the line, get my bags. So it was like it's, you'd land, and then you, you've got to go through all this, you know, disembark, and then go through the immigration, and they stamp your passport and all that, and then you, then you uh, to get your bags, and should I claim this or that? Is an old toothbrush, should I go through the green lane or the red lane? <laughs> <laughs> or a new toothbrush, should I? Want, uh, then the queues, waiting in queues. I found myself waiting in lines and then feeling annoyed with somebody because they didn't move fast enough or somebody was. Uh, the, the 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 person checking the passports was seemed to be taking all their time talking to some some person and feeling really come on let's get over it. get get through this line <laughs> and then looking at other lines that might you know you're looking around to see which is the shortest line that you can get through the quickest and, and you think this is it and then you find the one next to you is going everybody's moving faster through it. And, so just watching, reflecting on the, my mental state in regards to waiting in line, in queues, and just wanting to, because one did, I didn't value or appreciate immigration or anything, I just thought this is bureaucracy, you've got to get through it. So it's just to kind of resign yourself to get through it in a kind of negative mental state. And so it was, it was, you know, it could be, I could make international travel just for those kind of things quite an unpleasant experience because of my mind. So I started using this reflection, just seeing this restlessness, just get, waiting in a queue, man. I wanted to get, get through the queue as fast as possible. I didn't want to wait for very long. I wanted everything to move quickly so I could get out. So the whole thing was to to get out, get through it as quickly as possible. And any frustration or waiting period was was uh, resented. So noticing that, just reflecting on the feeling of it, I be, began to really quite enjoy waiting in queues and because I was taking an interest in what was going on in my mind. So the whole process became, I quite enjoy the whole thing. I mean, it's not, it's not something, it's not an unpleasant experience in itself, unless you want to make it one. <laughs> So it's like using something like that, that you can uh, say integrate practice into kind of ordinary situations that that maybe you you know that irritate you or or just think you don't you think you're just you're just doing something in order to to get through the line or finish off this and so part of your life is is not really respected or or looked at. It's just something you have to do so you do it in, in order to get it finished. So a lot of things we just do in order to finish them rather than really mindfully do them. And, and with the mindfulness then we find a lot of the things that irritate us aren't really irritating. But we are irritating the, we are irritating the conditions. So the story, the famous story about Ajahn Chai coming to London, and this this was one of my great insights when we when we first went to London in '77. He was sitting in the shrine room of this house in Hampstead, and it was a warm summer day, and and uh, 
we had the windows open, and the the, and the shrine room was on the. It was one of these four-story kind of Georgian townhouses. So the shrine room was on the third story, third floor, and this big kind of elegant Georgian window that we opened up and let in the air. And right across the street from this was a pub. And and at that time they were having a rock session in the pub, live music, while we were practic- while we were practicing meditation. We were sitting there, Ajahn Chah sitting there in the shrine room, and the shrine room was filled with people, and we were all trying to, you know, sit there in uh, calm, and trying to get tranquil, and then suddenly this. It was, all, it was really horrible rock music, too. It was <laughs> but really, it wasn't, wasn't very good rock music, even. So this is noise kept coming in, and you could tell everybody kind of, kind of grin and bear it and looking irritated and, and everything. And, and Ajahn Chah kept us sitting there for for an hour or so, this noise going on. He just, he just seemed to be, you know, peaceful, not minding it at all. So after he rang the bell and somebody said, we're sorry about that, Ajahn Chah, about that annoying music. And then he gave this very wise reflection. He said, well, you think, you think that the music was annoying you? And I said, yeah. I said, no. You were annoying the music. <laughs> that really hit me because I exactly, could see that's exactly what I was doing. I was saying, I hate that music, I don't want that music. <laughs> that, what am I doing? I'm annoying the music. That's a reflection, isn't it? That's reflective teaching is that, you know, the convention is that music is annoying me. That's how everybody would agree on that. Music is really annoying. I don't want it. We don't want that. It's annoying to us. And so we're sitting here, and it's annoying, I don't want it, wish it would stop, terrible music. What can you do in the city when they noisy, you can't really meditate because there's so much noise. Uh, grumble, grumble. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? I'm, a, I'm annoying. Isn't it? I'm annoying my own mind. Okay. I'm making, I'm, suff- I'm creating suffering. The, I think the, stu- the music's making me suffer. No, I'm making myself suffer around the music, around the horrible rock music. <laughs> so, uh, way of contemplating experience. Something like that, you know, that was a long time ago, but that particular, that really stuck me, you know, because it was like a reflection Lung Po Cha gave at a time where I was, was, I was receptive to that, obviously, because I was really, you know, I could identify with what I was, I was annoying myself. My resenting, by wanting to get rid of—I wasn't watching this. I wasn't watching during that time. I was sitting there, really believing. I don't want this music. It's terrible. I wasn't reflecting on what I was feeling, on my own annoyance and my aggravation. I was completely identified with it, and and just I felt righteous. I felt Ajahn Chah was probably feeling that way too. You know, here he comes, and 
gives us a medi- teaches us meditation. We're sitting there, and there's this, you know, this pub where they're drinking beer and playing this terrible music. You know, it's just not. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the thing, well, and I felt right, and, and everybody felt they were right. But we weren't looking at our own feeling of righteousness, and how, how I felt right, and, and uh, it shouldn't be like this. So. There, but there was no reflection on that. It was merely a San, uh, Sanupatana Kanda, an attachment to the Sanya Sankara identification with the Sanya, Vedana Sanya Sankara. So reflection then allows us to see if, if there's somebody, suddenly there is a, uh, you know, a, a a, a, a rock band suddenly comes up, sits in the middle of this hall, and starts blasting away. And we, we'd feel annoyed, wouldn't it? It'd be irritating, but certainly, uh, be, you know, if it was terrible rock music, especially. <laughs> <laughs> The musicians don't have any talent. <laughs> we feel irritated, and we feel you know these emotions arising. Then, then the reflection on those emotions. You see, or we or we could just attach. We could get caught up in our own self-righteous scenario and say, "This is this guy. They shouldn't allow this here at Spirit Rock. I'm going to report this to the committee." And if they allow things like this to happen, I'm not ever going to come here again. I didn't come here to, to hear that kind of thing and, and, get, and, and feel right. And we could all agree. With they, we're, we're all going together and protest. <laughs> and we're all full of our righteousness. And we're right, too. It? It they shouldn't, shouldn't have allowed that to happen. If this place were run properly, they would never let anything like that happen. We're all agreeing to this. But who's looking at, at who's reflecting on that feeling? You know? So this is, this is where it integrates into, into daily life. Is not, you're not going to, it doesn't mean you're not going to feel all these emotions, but learning to, to, to reflect on them, to say it feels like this, to feel indignant and upset and, and righteous feels like this. So what are, you, and then you're kind of looking, you know, in the silence of your mind you begin to see this kind of thing in the pit of your stomach, this knot of, of anger that, that's twisting right in your gut, so are you feel your own sense of, of, of being right, you know, this weak, of indign, uh, indign, righteous indignation. We can't allow things like this to happen. We can contemplate that feeling of, of just that power of, of righteous indignation and th- begin to see it as a condition arising and ceasing. So this is how we, we it doesn't mean we don't we, we don't act or, or you know, if things are wrong to, to try to make them right. But we're no longer caught in the power of our delusion, you see. So we can, we can use even the unfairness of life as practice. And the, the bitterness, the unfairness, the, the brutality, the abuse of life, all this is not an obstruction to enlightenment. The obstruction is our own blindness, our refusal to awaken. So then this is like putting, putting the, the onus on us. It's, it's up to each one of us to awaken. 
and that awakenness is something nobody can take away from us, isn't it? That's, that's, not, that's not dependent on having everything going my way and everything being right and on peace and harmony. Listen to that turkey. <laughs> 